So the next day I'm up on the floor, they run more tests and I was shocked when they come in and they say, your heart is only functioning at 15%. there and welcome to ASCC Overflowing Buckets. Today, we're thrilled to have the incredible Edwina Adams join us. You might know her as Edwina the Encourager, but did you know she's also survived a near-death experience and built a successful business from scratch? So Edwina's story is one of resilience, grit, and a whole lot of heart. She's turned her toughest challenges into her greatest assets and she's ready to share her secrets with you. In this episode, Edwin is going to reveal the power of noise, noise of inspiration, strength, and encouragement, and how it can transform your life. So get ready to be inspired, uplifted, and empowered. So let's dive in. Edwina, how are you? I'm good. Good to meet you. You as well. Oh, I'm so, so I, glad I, was... I got the memo. It's a black tank top kind of a day. Uh, right? Yeah. I love this. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Yes. Near death experience. How it's interesting how so many people, you know, when they're in the junk, in the yuck, and I hear this a lot, a lot of a lot of folks and we have a community and we come in and, and we're around folks and we're like, oh, we're so sorry you're going through this and you're going through this. And and when 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 we're young, we're like, oh, why, why, why? This is awful. And you think it's the end of the world. But I think when folks are older, right, a lot of times yeah. we're like, okay, <laughs> what's the lesson here? What's the lesson here? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the difference between youth and, and when we're older. So- <laughs> that wisdom. Yes. It's that wisdom of, so what happened? What was the lesson and what's the wisdom that we can gain from your journey? So maybe we don't have to go through that horrible experience and gain from your, from, from learning from you. So first of all, thank you for sharing because so that we don't have to go through it. Well, you know, that that's what I think is important. I think it is important for for me to share. I think it's important for other people to share when they've experienced things like this, and then they have gained that wisdom. And I think it's important for shows like yours to highlight these stories, right? Because we do all learn from each other. And what happened in my situation was I have always been a very healthy person. Now, I am about, to, I'm 48 plus, I'll be 49 in January. So I'm a middle-aged woman, right? But I have always ha been very, very healthy and blessed with that health. In 2020, uh, my family and I had moved back from Chicago to Texas and <clears throat> It was right at the height of COVID. So I don't know if I had COVID. I was sick in January, but that was before we knew that was even a thing. And we moved back in, um, let's see, May of 2020. Well, very quickly after moving back, um, I say very quickly, with a month or so, I just started feeling really drained, you know, and it's not like me to nap and I'm napping a lot and um, just not feeling well. I actually thought I had some stomach issues or something. So one day my kids had already gone to bed and I told my husband, I'm just going to drive myself to the ER, get checked out. I'll be back in a little bit. <clears throat> and they don't know how I drove myself there. They don't know how I walked in. <laughs> Uh, now I was, I was feeling much worse than I let on, but that's how I am. I'm a former paramedic and medical people are terrible about that. I'm like, I could just do this, but, um, that was terrible of me to do that. So if you're sick and you need help, ask for help. But, uh, so I'm in the ER and they actually were about to discharge me. They were writing up the discharge papers when the doctor looked up to write down my current vitals. And she said, oh my gosh, uh, her heart rate is so high. We're not, we can't even legally send her home. Like what, what is going on? So they look back and my heart rate had been that high the whole time. So they, they come in, they're like, we, we can't let you go. We're going to run more tests. They do that and they still don't know what's going on, but they said, it's bad. Whatever's happening, like we don't know if it's cancer, we don't know if it's organ failure, but you're not, we, we got to figure this out. So the next day I'm up on the floor, they run more tests, and I was shocked when they come in and they say, 
your heart is only functioning at 15%. Um, now you can drop dead if it's below 35%, like sudden death can happen easily if it's below 35%. So here I was at 15% and they didn't understand why. I had never used drugs. I was not a 90 year old woman, you know, and they're like, this is not normal. Like we got to figure out what's going on. How were you feeling physically and oh. mentally that, what was it about you that you felt like you were able to be discharged at 15%? Like, I'm just wondering, because there's so many of us like, like, like they shouldn't have discharged you. You should be at that point. You should have dropped dead, but you oh, were I, I still like have, willing yes. to like move forward. Like, like you were okay. Like, okay, discharge me. What no, is it? Like I wasn't really, actually, I wasn't really, I mean, I was not wanting to be in the hospital, but I remember crying whenever they had tried something and it, it didn't work. And, and I just was crying. Cause I was like, something is seriously wrong. Like, I feel felt like death, you know, mm. and um, but I guess when you're feeling that badly, you don't verbalize things well, right? Yeah. So I'm sure my mind wasn't functioning at high capacity. That's and why you need an I, advocate. Yeah. You do. Advocates are so important. And um, I just was like, I, I yeah, I remember crying in the room, and then they came back and they were like, "Well, we don't know. I mean, there's nothing we can do. We're just gonna send you home and let us know if it get worse, you know, kind of a thing." And um, and then thank God, like I said, they just were like, "Oh my gosh, her heart rate is out of control. We can't send her home because I truly believe I would have died, most definitely. Matter of fact, um, the next." Happened? So, so I'll, I'll go back to when they came in and said, you know, you're 15% and this is bad. Like, this is really bad. And, you know, the next days or so, it just kind of escalated. And, and I had doctors coming in that like their top cardiologist there was like, there's no way you can survive this. <laughs> he said, you can't survive with your heart like this. Um, you might have a year to live kind of a thing. Well, not kind 15%, of a thing. That is yeah. Like, <laughs> And, uh, that's so when, when you it say escalate, really how did it escalate? Like your heart just went, well, I just was, I felt so bad. Like I said, I, I truly, I felt like death. Um, that's and awful. Sorry I, I don't that. explain it other than that. Um, it, it's, and how long did that last? So with me, um, I had such a weird encounter, I'll say. Um, so, you know, I have a doctor coming in telling me you're lucky if you live a year. Now I didn't want to scare my husband with this information. <laughs> He's at home with my, at that time, my, uh, what eight and nine year old or seven and eight year old. Uh, and, um, he was already worried enough. So I, I call a friend and I didn't want to scare my parents either. They're older, you know, and I knew that would just devastate them to hear this. So I call a friend. I said, look, I'm in a really dark place right now. And I cannot believe that I'm going to die and leave, you know, my husband and kids. I'm like, I just cannot believe this is my story. This is totally coming out of nowhere, you know? And so, you know, she, she prayed with me and of course I prayed on my own and it's during COVID. So you can't have visitors. I, I could have my husband up there like during the day for a few hours, but he was the only person that could come and see me. And, um, why, I don't know, within a day or so after just really saying, okay, God, <laughs> there's nothing I can do. Like, this is in your hands. Um, I had such a peace, like true peace to the point where doctors would walk in the room and they were like, do you understand what's going on? And I said, yeah, I, I truly do. I mean, I was in the medical field. I get what you're saying, but I think I'm going to be all right. Well, I had some things happen. I, I nearly crashed. I mean, they literally opened the crash card. The room got real weird. I don't remember everything, but I do remember, like I said, as a former paramedic who has 
done CPR many times, who has shocked people and all kinds of things, I, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I know what's happening next, and I cannot believe this is happening. Um, I'm the room, everything's black around me. <clears throat> and I know I'm about to go out. And I tell, I hear the, the doctor say something, but she was, she said the wrong thing. It was something I had relayed to the nurse prior to this happening. And the doctor's repeating it. And the nurse is like, yeah. And, and I, and I'm, my eyes are closed. Everything's dark. Even if I open my eyes and I said, no, that's not what I said. And I said, whatever. And they were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you answered me. <laughs> and, um, and that helped them though. Right. That helped them that I had that ability to yeah. tell them this. And I don't remember much after that. I know that I went to ICU and from there they tell me, okay, we think you're going to need a new heart. I, I just think that's where you're at. And um, because we had just moved back to Texas, my husband was a mental health therapist, but he, you know, had, didn't have his job up there anymore. He moved back to Texas. He had applied to get his Texas licensure, but the state of Texas was shut down and nobody was answering their phones. Nobody, they had, they had like cashed our check and everything to like process his <laughs> uh, licensure, but the department but no to more, cash no a check was open, but the department to issue yeah. the license was not. Yes. Yes, it was a very weird situation. So like my, there were people like places wanted to hire him. He couldn't get a job because he didn't have a Texas license. Oh. We didn't have health insurance. And here I am dying, right? And I'm now I'm a needing new heart. a new heart. And oh. we have no insurance. So I, I finally get out of ICU and there was this young doctor. He was an intern. He came in one day and he said, this is like a long shot. I honestly, I don't see it happening. He said, you know, you, I know you know you need a new heart, but the only way for somebody, a transplant surgeon to accept you is you need insurance. So basically you're not gonna get that. <laughs> he said, but my job today, he comes in like seven in the morning. He said, I'm gonna, I don't care if I'm on the phone all day long, I am going to be making phone calls, seeing if somebody in Houston would accept you. You know, he's like, I don't know, but it's a long shot. He came in, I'm going to say maybe an hour, hour and a half later, and he just was like beaming with this smile and he was in shock. And he said, I, I don't even know how this is happening. He said, but you're going to Houston today. And he said, not only are you, have you been accepted to St. Luke's, but the top transplant surgeon has accepted you. And he's like, even without insurance, he wants to meet you. He is in, intrigued by your story and um, you're going today. And I was like, oh my gosh. Well, I get down to Houston. <clears throat> and again, this whole time, I'm just joyful. I mean, the doctors are We're in shock. Have to come back and when you say joyful. intrigued by your story, I want to know what story intrigued him. Well, what intrigued him <clears throat> was my age. And that I was so diminished in my mm, heart okay. health and that I had no history Your medical and that I had, you know, I had driven myself in <laughs> and walked in just the whole thing. He was just like, well, let me see this girl. <laughs> and, see. um, so I go down there, um, thinking, you know, I never wanted to get a transplant. Like who wants to go through that? Yeah. But I had, I had just had this piece of like, whatever's to happen happens. And, um, but I knew that I was going to be okay, whatever happened. So I go down there, he ran several tests and I re I don't remember much of it. I, I was so sick and I remember him still having his face mask on after a procedure <clears throat> and we're still in like the, it wasn't surgery. It was like the the cath room or something bright lights and he's standing over this gurney type thing and he i could see he just had a big smile through his mask and he said i don't know what is going on with your heart i don't know why you're in the situation you're in he said but i don't think you need a new heart and i said okay i can accept that <laughs> he's like let's just uh 
I've got some things I'm going to do, but let's, I don't think you need a new heart. So time goes by and I'll fast forward. It's a longer story, but I, I was only able to go home weeks later, uh, wearing a defibrillating life vest. And that was because it does just that. If, if I were to have a cardiac event and drop dead, it would shock me. And typically they only let you wear those a few months and that's to get your heart maybe with meds, bring your heart function up a little higher. So you're, it's safe enough to do a surgery to do like a defibrillator placement or any other surgeries. Cause I was so fragile. They didn't even want to do surgery on me. <clears throat> and, um, I go home wearing this defibrillating life vest. And again, I'm not advocating that people do this. I just had a internal knowing I had a piece. I had such a I just knew that I was not going to die. God had promised me that. And I was running on the treadmill, not always wearing my life vest and different <laughs> things. And because I was slowly like getting myself back up mm -hmm. and, and getting my heart stronger. And um, one day I went to an office visit and his nurse was telling me, she's like, your, your function is up. I had done another test. The function was up higher, but it was only like 20 something percent. And I was pretty bummed because I thought, oh man, I really felt like it was higher and I could get this vest off. Now they didn't know I wasn't always wearing it, but she said, we got to schedule you to get your defibrillator placed and, you know, just be careful. Always be wearing the vest because this is, you're in a very, very dangerous situation. And I was like, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so I, I asked them, I said, can we, I don't think I'm going to need that defibrillator. Will you give me more time to wear the vest? And I had to talk them reluctantly into letting me wear it. I wore it, ended up wearing it for eight months instead of the normal three or so. And but prior to even the eight months being up and prior to me having another test to prove that my heart function was up, um, I had been, I think to was, it was a third appointment and my heart function was still not up high enough. And she, the nurse scared me. I mean, she just said, don't have this vest off. You, you should already have had a defibrillator placed. You are in a very, very fragile situation. Like the, you could die. You know, and I went home that day and where I would normally just kind of take off my vest and because I just had this peace and like, I wasn't mm -hmm. fearful of death, mm -hmm. I was petrified and mm -hmm. I was so fearful and I was in the bathroom and I, and I would, like I said, normally take my shirt off and take the vest off. And, um, I couldn't do it. I was gripped by this fear. So I'm like, I'm just going to leave this on. And then the next day I felt, I, I guess you can say depressed. Um, I've never had depression, but I was like night and day from my months of being joyful and, and everything. And I remember I was in the bathroom again, just looking in the mirror and I thought, I'm going to die. I just, I cannot believe I'm going to die. And I just, all these negative thoughts and this darkness the was just shifted. Oh, like, like night and day. And then it, it, that dawned on me. I was like, why have I been joyful and at peace all these months? And now all of a sudden I'm terrified, like literally terrified. And right there in the mirror, looking at myself, I felt God say, because you don't believe my promise anymore. Mm. I said, oh my gosh, that's what it is. I don't believe it. And again, I'm not, if you are told to wear a life vest, wear one. This is my personal journey. And like, thank you for sharing. You, yes. You're on. But I, but I knew I was like, that is true. I have believed and had this faith and I have zero faith right now. And I am terrified. I literally depressed. I feel a darkness around me. And I said, no, that's not true though. I do believe what I was told. And I took the vest off and that vest weighs like, I don't know, a few pounds. It literally felt like I took off 25 pounds. 
like I was like, and I just started laughing like in the, I was in the this bathroom by myself and I'm just giggling and I was like, okay, I'm good. And girl, I was flying high from then. And then a few months later, I go to get a final test. Well, now is a final test. And uh, he turns around at the chair, the cardiologist does, and he says, um, your heart function is better than somebody who has never been through heart failure. Yeah. You can take that vest off and I'll see you in a year. And I was like, what? <laughs> and um, that's where I was in 2021. I was, you know, uh, off the vest. I hadn't had to have any surgeries. And I, I think the bigger story though, is that I had this peace and this joy through that journey. And that's what taught me a lot. There was a few things I learned that I speak about now and that I've written about. The The biggest one is I, I started painting again and I hadn't painted in almost 30 years. And when I was in junior high and high school, I would do oil paintings. <clears throat> and I don't know if you've ever painted, but with oil painting, you have a lot of control. You can change a, a bird into a tree it, two days later, you know, like the yeah. oil is very workable. And, um, and you have a lot of control. Well, I started um, watercolor painting and I'd never done that before. <clears throat> and here I am sitting at my dining room table. And at that time I was still wearing my life vest and I'm doing this literally, watercolor, literally. And I'm learning, you know, how to paint with watercolors and, and I'm just by myself. And I remember thinking, oh, this is so different from oils because Again, you have so much control with the oil and in my head, I'm just thinking now the difference. And I said to myself, I, I don't have control with this. Like the water has control. And I just started crying <laughs> and I was like, that's like me. I have no control over this situation. But if I let go and let the water do what it does, this beautiful masterpiece happens anyway and it may look different than i thought it was going to look but it's beautiful it's beautiful and that's what happens in our lives you know if you let go and letting go is there's action in letting go you still have to show up you still have to do things you know, as a painter, I still have to sit down with the paint. I have to get the paintbrush out. I have to get the right paper. There's action, right? right? But you still let go. And the letting go is knowing I'm not in control. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be. So that was my biggest takeaway is that, <clears throat> you know, for me as a, a mother and a business owner, an entrepreneur, a paramedic there's a lot of control involved mm -hmm. we just need to know we really have no control right so like the watercolor there's a there's the parts where you do control like you control the amount of water you control the amount of pigment you control how the technique on the paintbrush you there's that part right there's that part you control um and you go with the flow right like you maybe put the, too much pigment and then you go with that flow, right? You might have added yeah. too much water there and you and you go with it. Unlike the watercolor where you're like, oh, I'll let it dry. We'll work with it later, right? Like whatever. Mm -hmm. is, is, am I correct on that? Ish? Yes. And that's yes. what I'm saying. Like there's, there's action and letting go. There are still things you do, right? You still show up. You still show up in your life. You get up and you try another day, right? But just that knowing that you don't have to control every little facet and worry that you're not doing the right thing. How like, do you just make do that what you can do on like when to like, how do you make the decision on, okay, like let it all go and just like, whew, forget it all. <laughs> you know, I'm letting it all go. Lord, take the wheel. I'm letting it all go. I'm going to go under the covers. I'll see you in a yeah. year. You know, yeah. to, to like, okay, 
I, I need to, to the opposite end of, I'm going to control every single facet and not give any, you know, give up all there's that middle ground, right? Yeah. How do we find that middle ground to where we we're working with God versus alongside, alongside the water, alongside yeah. and working along? How do you find that balance and find that peace along that journey? There is a simple answer for that. When you feel in your heart that anxious feeling, and we all know what that is, where our heart rate is getting faster and we're stressed out and you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, if I don't do this, this will happen. And what if I, and it's all these future thoughts, you know, when those are bombarding you, mm -mm, that's not your job. There's no way for you to know what's going to happen in the future. That's where you let go. Because those future thoughts um, cause that anxiety, you know? Right. As a matter of fact, science has even proven, the Bible talks about it, but we now we know like, oh, that's what they were talking about and science has actually proven it. <laughs> when you replace your thoughts with truthful thoughts, that feeling literally goes away. So when you're feeling that and that anxiety is building up, you just say, okay, there's nothing I can do about that. But what can I do in this moment? And that's where there's action involved. Okay, I can't fix my child maybe getting into drugs when they go to school. What can I do? Mm. Well, I can be a loving parent. I can let them know that I'm here to talk to them. I can let them know the damage that can happen, you know, but I can't control what my child does. You, you see what I'm right. saying? And that works in every, in everything with your business. Like, oh my gosh, what if this doesn't happen? And now I'm going to be overdrawn and I can't pay our employees. And you're just like freaking out and you're getting sick. Okay. I don't even know if that's going to happen, but what can I do? Right. What can I do right now? And it literally just works with everything. And I'm telling you, I was the person who lived in the future, um, lived there. And I did have those future thoughts. And it has been life changing to know that I don't have to live there and I don't have to figure it all out. And I don't have to worry to fix it all. But I do, but I am still a person of action. Very much so. I mean, heck, I wrote a book while I was, I actually went back into heart failure um, <clears throat> this past December. And even when that happened, I was like, oh man, are you serious? I was really shocked that that happened, but I just let it go. Um, and I was able to actually do all these things that I've been teaching that I have learned from that first time. I ended up writing a book during that second time in heart failure. I was wearing a defibrillating heart vest again, uh, mm -hmm. life vest. And um, it's just a powerful thing and it's not fake. It's not just. So you took action in the things that you could take action in and you let go of the worry of any of what could possibly happen that was outside of your control, but you took action yeah. on the things that you knew that you could control. Exactly. I mean, I remember that first time when um, I had, I was in ICU and this team of doctors had come in and said, I was probably just needed a new heart. And my husband was sad, you know, and I said, you know, here's the thing. I don't believe I'm going to die. I, he's like, well, I don't know how you know that. I said, I don't really know how I know that either, but I, it's just a feeling I have. Now, let's say I'm wrong, though. I said, the truth is, I could be in this ICU room. You could go down to the car, drive home to mm -hmm. the kids, and on the way to your drive home, you could be T-boning killed today. I don't know. 
as a paramedic, you you've seen a lot. Yeah. yeah. Said, we just don't know what's going to happen. But I don't feel like that's going to happen. So let's just not live in that future thought of, oh my gosh, you could be driving home today and get killed, you know? Yeah. So I said, I'm not going to lay here in this ICU room, ICU room thinking, oh my gosh, I could die tomorrow. Maybe right. I do. Maybe I don't. Right. I can't control that. Well, the truth Here's is that we control. all will die. <clears throat> yes. That is the truth. And it is, I, was, I was at a mastermind. I said, well, if we die, and I said, why did I say if? So when we die, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, right. what is this? Why did I say if? Because that that is one of the hundred percent sureties of life. The only thing, yes, right. That is that is a hundred percent surety is that that will happen, and um, so it's how we're living it. And I love that you're living it like that. May I ask how how are we now with our heart? How are we now with our health? I feel great. Um, I actually don't know what my heart function is at right now. I'll go back to my doctor in December is my next time that I'll probably Fantastic. have a uh, echo done to see, but I'm just not worried about it. I mean, if he tells me it's at 32, if he tells me it's at 45, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not worried about it. I'm just, I take care of myself um, I, and I'm not I just don't stress about it at night. I don't lay my head on the pillow and think, oh my gosh, is my heart rate, is my heart function down and am I going to die? And I just don't think about it. Um, what just... are the things that you do think about every day? What are the things that you do to architect your day to day? I am driven to help other people know that they don't have to live in fear. So for one, I don't push myself like I used to. I used to just kind of be a workaholic. Uh, all, I guess that's what it was because I just, I mean, I would be happy to sit down and work all day and I would forget to eat, you know, that's not good. <laughs> um, but now I just, if I want to go on a bike ride, I go on a bike ride. If I want to sit down and paint, I sit down and paint. And if I don't make money that day, I don't make money that day. I don't worry about it. Um, I, I have found that when I allow myself to rest, my creativity is greater. So then when I do sit down, well, I'll get inspired. So while I'm riding a bike or while I'm just painting or hanging out, I'll have this flood of information that'll be like, oh my gosh, that is something I would totally love to teach on. And then I can go sit down and very quickly, it doesn't take me hours and hours and hours of drafting some course or whatever, but I can very quickly jot it all down. And now I have this information that I could easily teach somebody in a teachable format, right? right. Because it's just so inspired. So you actually work easier. It's, you know, you're not working, you're working smarter. You're not, not living, you're not living up here with your energy. Yeah. You're living with your energy mm -hmm. in a flow. Yeah. You know? And, you know, people talk about it and you're like, oh, that sounds great. But man, it, it really is a thing, you know, and you How probably you achieve that know? without having to have a near death experience. Like, like what is the first thing that you'd say if just do this? And I have, you know, people are like, Hey, be aware. Okay. Be aware. Like, and, and I hear this, you know, like I get it. It's, it's not, um, it's, it takes a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and so often people, when they hit this transformation, um, there's so much, like you have a test testimonial, right? Is there a way to have a transformation without having to have such a huge testimonial? Right. Wouldn't that be nice? Um, here's what I think. I think if there is a way, the way is to listen to as many of these stories as possible because 
I'm not the only one telling this scenario, right? There are thousands, millions of people who have like, oh my gosh, I finally learned. Oh my gosh, I finally learned. And it's because of these type of situations. I will say this too. Um, <clears throat> so if there's a way to learn, maybe that's it. Otherwise, my adversity won't be your adversity, but we're all going to have it. And what it took for me may not be the same thing it takes for you. So it might take something different in your life to happen for you to finally get it. Um, I had a gentleman on my podcast not long ago, and he had the loss of a child. And it was so profound what he said. <clears throat> he said, you know, one of the things he hated that people would come up and say was, um, well, you know, God only gives you what you can handle. <laughs> and he was like, no, no, that's not even biblical, actually. Mm -hmm. God gives you more than you can handle. And yeah. it, will, it will break you. And when you're broken, then you finally are like, see the bigger picture. But what is it going to take to break you? For me, it took near death. I'm very hard headed, though. Not everybody it takes, you know, it needs it to be that drastic. Um, it just may take uh, maybe a, a, re a strain in a relationship or something in your business that happened or an encounter with an employee that's really dramatic. I mean, who knows? Um, but there's something out there that can get you to that point because you're hard headed and stubborn in certain areas. It'll take something for you to say, oh my gosh, now I get it. I think um, people who are driven, extremely driven, right, have a tendency to be probably be more hard headed than others. Um, yeah. And I hear a lot of like talk about being awareness and it becoming aware and having oh. that reality check. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that, you know, you hear people say that. My husband, like I said, is now a mental health therapist. So when he started getting his training, um, he recognized that I was the person who needed to like not have so many future thoughts and just live in the moment. And he would mention things to me like that. Well, he was the wrong person to do that. Right. <laughs> and so like, <laughs> you're not the one I need to hear that from. I did not accept it and was like, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm just trying to work. I like working, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I had my reasons for the way I was, the way I was. And, but he could see it from the outside looking in that like, yeah. I needed to chill, you know, and <clears throat> it, that didn't help me. It didn't help me having a trained professional see it, recognize well, it. The trained professional happened let me know. your husband. Yeah. Right. Right. But I don't even know if I would have taken it from anybody else. Honestly, mm, I just, um, the, what was your reason? Well, at that time, so I had started a business and well, he and I had sold a business for the intent for him to go back to school. And I was totally on board with that. I supported it. I'm glad he did it. Um, he went back to school full time, but we had two very young children, barely two and then a four month old. And I didn't have any family around to help babysitter with mm -hmm. babysitting or anything. And I didn't have money for a babysitter because I had just poured a bunch of money into a new business, one that I had yeah. had um, an idea for seven years. And I was like, oh, I can finally do it. You know, I don't know what I was thinking because again, he was in school full time. I had these two babies. I was overwhelmed. And then I started this business. And so I was just full of anxiety and again, a ton of future thoughts. So my drive at that time was if I don't do it, it's not going to work. Oh my, you know, it's me, me, me. I've got it. It's, it's all on me. And mm -hmm. it was too much. I mean, nobody can handle that. Right. You know? And, and so you felt like if you slowed down or took your foot off the pedal, everything would just fall yeah. apart. Right. And then what? Right. Y yeah. I, then what? Right. Um, I don't know that I, I think for me, it would have been like, what I would look silly to people or whatever, you know, um, which who cares, who cares if you look silly to people. So I think that's, if you need to that's the around, number oh, one fear that people have is, you know, the fear of what would other people think? Oh, I was just curious. So yeah. So again, it's that future 
it's that thing in the future going on in the mm -hmm. future. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything that you have coming up that you'd like to share with us that you've got coming up? Well, <clears throat> yeah. So, you know, I call myself an adversity architect because I believe adversity really is your greatest asset. So whatever that adversity is, that's going to, in the moment you think this is going to break me, um, if you hold on and you let that n not break you, but change you in a good way, then you really can come out on the other side of that and make what I call noise. And that's my acronym for a narrative of inspiration, strength, and encouragement. So it doesn't mean you have to become a podcast host or a speaker or an author. You don't even have to do any of those things. You can, anybody can, but at a minimum, you can make this positive noise, turn that adversity into noise and be so um, powerful for the people, <clears throat> for your children, for your neighbors, for your coworkers, for your employees, like they need your noise, right? So <clears throat> if you're in a position and you're like, that's me, I've had this adversity and I've it's changed me and I feel like there's something inside me, like a business or a nonprofit or just this idea, but I don't know how to bring it all together. Um, I do that. I help people. So there, I have a wait list right now for my next group coaching for that. And so I merge my nearly two years of two decades of business experience and consulting with that into this package. What's, your, what's the name of your book? Uh, so the book I wrote, I co-authored is called Dare to Dream Big. I'm actually, my chapter in it is called Become a Noisemaker. And I'm actually turning that into its own book. I'm going to expound upon it some, but um, yeah. I'm excited about that. I think that that's a fantastic concept. And Thank you. Uh, I love Dare to Dream Big. And, um, and I love this concept of of one controlling the noise, controlling your narrative in your mm -hmm. head, because I think a lot of times the narrative that we have, the noise that we have in our head is something that we is it's somebody else's voice that has been given to us. Thank you for allowing us to learn through your lessons and not have to yeah. go through those lessons that you went through. I appreciate you tremendously. Thank you. You're very welcome. And again, I encourage people to go hear other people's stories of this. Just keep filling your head with these because um, it's it's the message we all need to hear. Absolutely. All right. Thank you for filling our buckets. Mm -hmm.